Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Anna Kailers Walters, founder of Red Container Coffee. That is tiny me um, down in that slide. Looking very happy. At that day, I was able to enter one of the terminals in Santa Sports City, where I was born. Also, the port that most exports coffee in the world. Um, at the right, you see some pictures of olives. Joking. That's actually coffee screen 20 and uh, Pacamara variety. I decided to put that because uh, it shows how in coffee, uh, the most beautiful things you're always learning this. Even though I go every year to Brazil, uh, twice, sometimes even three times per year, it was the first time I encountered such a big screen, luscious coffee, which by the way, I'm selling. Yeah, just, just kidding. But anyways, thank you, SCAA. It's an honor, uh, SCA. it's an honor. as you see. I've, I've been in this industry for a while. <laughs> But uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, the first job I actually got in the coffee industry was in a SEA event back in 2000. I was a booth girl for Cafés do Brasil. My father was also past president in 2005 uh, in Seattle. So yes, as Kim mentioned, I am from a family of coffee, coffee traders, third generation. Yet, uh, I had to you know, get to the coffee fields and get lost in the, some coffee roads in order to find uh, my path in the coffee industry. So then uh, Red Container came about four years ago. My slogan is, what's outside your box? We know the quality, but what about the outside? And my, um, my philosophy is quality, transparency, sustainability, repeatability, and research. And enough about me, let's get this started. Um, this, this slide shows a little bit uh, of the points we're going to hit. It's uh, many different factors that are adding to our current situation we're seeing in the market uh, as it goes up. But it's not only the market, the seed market that's going up. Uh, prices in general for everyone, costs of coffee is increasing to producer and the logistics side. Um, of course, the seed market for importers as well as roaster and consequently to the final consumer. So here's some points we're gonna uh, hit, the COVID era, logistics, weather, big, big challenge for us this crop year and the Brazilian volume. All right, first hit, the COVID era. The fear of the unknown, port restriction on shipments, unloading and loading from COVID dangerous zone, zones. Worldwide lockdown, social distancing, limited travels, limited workforce at farm level, which is uh, the biggest uh, issue I've been seeing from my producer friends. Every single one of them were complaining about um, how hard it was this crop, uh, past crop year and since COVID hit to find workforce. Um, everyone living in a lot of fear, of course. Uh, closing of coffee shops. Wow, I, I don't know how you guys manage that. And uh, of course, the physical and mental state of the world, uh, as the world is forced to adapt to a new reality. The list can go on and on. But um, yeah, let's start with some images from last year. This is uh, when COVID hit. I was living in Florida. Uh, needless to say, coffee brings a lot of travel, and Florida was a very strategic point where I'm many hours from anywhere. Uh, very close to Central's, so, uh, to Brazil, to the American market, yet eight, nine hours away from Europe. So it was a good point to be. But when uh, COVID hit, I decided to uh, move to Denmark. And my Danish grandfather actually moved to Brazil on behalf of coffee as a coffee buyer. And I thought with uh, the closing of all uh, the conferences and uh, limited travel, it would be a good idea to move back and uh, teach my kids some Danish and some Danish culture. But prior to moving straight here, it was uh, early harvest season, so I decided to go to Brazil. Everyone was calling me a little bit crazy. At that point, we didn't really know too much about COVID, and uh, of course, the fear of entering an airplane was, was there. But uh, I decided to go because this is my job, this is what I do. Red Container is all about connecting um, origin to the final uh, consumer to the, the buyer. So I took my chances and I went. Here's a quick video. It's just the start. The full video, it's in my Instagram, my coffee adventures there. But it shows a little bit of that initial chaos. As you see, this is May 8, so very early harvest. This is Veloso Coffee in Cerrado. Um, 
But yeah, anyways, you, as you can see, airports were a scary place to be. COVID strikes, stri strikes the world and we still don't know exactly what's going on. I think we still don't know, but back then it was even worse. Um, very dangerous and, and, and um, scary scenario with protests all around, blockage of roads, even to go to farm, we weren't really sure if we were gonna make. I went with a friend this year, the lonely coffee broker and his mask and the new protocols for cupping. And following through, was that, it was, was that okay now? Were your viewers, viewers able to see the video? All right, well, let's continue. Let me know if not. Uh, let's go to logistics. Wow, this is being a true pain in the beep for us. Sorry, pardon my language, but um, it's just a snowball of events. After COVID started, Port started having restriction um, on ships that would arrive from dangerous areas, um, more infected COVID areas. Uh, which caused a huge limbo of ships and containers and wrong ports. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, China increased their exports uh, from Brazil, or I'm sorry, we're importing more from Brazil. So Brazilians export increased um, due to China's high demand. And I'm not only talking about coffee here, I'm talking about every single logist, uh, um, commodity Brazil can produce. And uh, that just added more to the math. After March, we started seeing lack of containers also due to this high volume of export, uh, exportation um, to China and other countries. Um, going back, I'm sorry, one month I skipped that. The protest in Colombia, that was uh, very, very challenging because I'm not sure uh, who knows this and who's in more in the logistics area. But a as a container leaves Brazil, it doesn't go straight to the destination. It will have stops, um, Colombia and other ports to load and load uh, or whatever. And uh, a, main, a major player is the Colombia port of Buenaventura, which streets were blocked because of these protests. And uh, the port was closed for about, I think it was uh, 45 days, if I be they are, are so wrong, but it was weeks. And this port, uh, it's pro I, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it's the biggest port in the Pacific coast. It is the biggest port in Colombia. So it's a major player in worldwide logistics. So the closing of the Colombia didn't only alter the, the deliveries for the Colombian coffee, but as well as Brazil and many other origins. Um, so going back to after March, where we saw a lack of containers, and the problem keeps growing with um, the queue. Uh, cancellations for bookings, loading and departure is a reality in our everyday right now. Uh, I spoke to Walters and Associate in Brazil, uh, Felipe, he's the heads of logistics and he was telling me uh, the cancellations are actually happening every day. A longer transit paths uh, in order to get these coffees to the, or whatever commodity to the destination we're having to find alternative paths without closing up different ports and um, uh, coffees that would usually pass that would take 30 days to, to arrive are now taking 100 days. So more, more delays in our ETAs and contract deliveries. Um, the increase of freight this day, I think it was about three weeks ago, it, I was quoting with uh, Ocean Freights one day the, the freight was $3,000. The next day, it went up to like seven fifty. dollars out of the blue. It was really fast. No, well, I got no warning. And uh, that definitely accounts into the final price of coffee. So an increase of 150% is a very big increase. Um, now, recent news. Two weeks ago, the closing of terminals in China. Uh, that had a big effect. Gladly, this morning I saw the news and the terminal final open. This terminal is 25% of the third biggest port in the world. So two weeks of closing of such an important terminal can definitely add to all this delays. Thankfully, this morning we got the good news is back on. Um, booking availability to different destinations. This is also being a huge challenge. Felipe, again, my friend from Walters, he mentioned that um, depending on the destination, you can or not get booking. 
So speaking from Brazil right now, so Europe is taking about six to eight weeks to get your booking if you get have a good relationship. Um, from Brazil to uh, the west, uh, I'm sorry, east coast of USA, it's being almost impossible, not impossible, uh, depending if you have good relationship, big contracts, but many are simply not being able to get into that list. And West Coast is even worse. So it's, it's, been, it's been a challenge, not only the delays, now we're not being able to find uh, fast bookings. And from what I've been talking to some partner friends, farms, exporters, as well as my, my family's brokerage walters, it's a, there's a word in the market where the loaders are also having a preference, uh, of course, to bigger contracts, pre preference also to um, longer relationship and of container weight. So basically they are prioritizing containers that weigh less in order to fit more in a ship. And that unfortunately does not account coffee. So it's, a, it's, a, it's just problems after problems. And uh, our reality today is Please, if you need some coffee, I count that time into it because it will take longer than usual. All right, um, let me give it a stop here. So the top video, we're gonna, we're gonna speak about the perfect storm right now, which was when the frost arrived. And um, the top video, you're gonna notice some, um, I'm sorry, let me just stop this one. The top video, it's, Brazilian uh, results in the south of Minas. This is one of my partner farms, as in the Santa Uh You'll see several different images, but we'll go back to that. I first want you guys to focus in this bottom video, which I'll show different images, but here is Veloso Coffee in Cerrado. And it's a great example of the drought. As you see this beautiful Cerrado color soil, reddish soil, this all should be under the water as it is every year when I go. So there it's evident that the drought has been a problem. Here we go to south of Minas with producer Hugo Brito from Santa de Virgens. He got 200 hectares affected by the, the frost. But this is early June, we saw many defects already. So I randomly in the hotel room actually before leaving, I got 20 random cherries and opened them up which I got straight from the patio. And as you see, it was nine good, nine black shoju or mushi undeveloped and two green, which is an alarming uh, result in quality. And this is back in June. And right now we're seeing that in fact, uh, there is a huge problem with uh, Brazilian coffee quality. And I've been here from different, uh, different parts of Brazil that is bigger than expected. Uh, now the drought, you can see baby trees completely burned to the branch. In other images, you can notice you still see a little green leaves in the bottom. That's less of a damage, but the, the, the scenes are uh, a horror show. This is a Hasepa. I filmed this in Matas Minas in one of my organic farms, Clem. And uh, it's a good example of a Hasepa and what can, will probably be done to most of Brazilian, oh, that's beautiful, cascara nutrition right there, organic. Oh, nice, rich in potassium. But back to the plantation. Uh, this is a plantation that was 10 years old. They did one year ago the Hesepa, so it shows how much it can grow in one year time, which shows how much it will take for us to get these tree back into production. So we're talking about three years until we, we, we see those beautiful cherries again for um, trees that will have to go through the Hesepa and uh, the cutting of the branch. So yeah, the perfect storm arrived disguised as frost. The um, crop started funky uh, with the September uh, rain. And we, instead of having one nice flower, flowering, we, uh, we had up to four different flower, flowerings, depending where you know, you know, the farm is located, which caused, of course, different development stages. And it results in more greens. So we have to remember Brazil is mainly mechanical pick and the machine cannot separate the unripe from the ripe so it all goes in the batch and it results in more greens in the lots and the more farm, farm, I'm sorry the mall farm beans due to the lack of rain and extreme heats that followed um, this crop we're working on the 2020 I'm sorry 2122 
And it, it is a, a low yield crop, yet it comes from <clears throat> our, our um, super crop last year. So these plants are tired and stressed. So over all this stress, they've been in the super crop last year. Now they're having to deal with the extreme heat. So they are not rested um, uh, plants. And that can be even bigger of a problem. Uh, as then, of course, the perfect storm, frost. Out of nowhere it came. I was talking to producer Ugo Brito, myself with Nina's partner, just the day, the whole day before, because I was editing some of his images, and he gave me no warning. The next morning I arrive, uh, I wake up with the news from Walters and Associate of Frost. I'm calling everyone. And everyone was caught, gone by surprise. It, it arrived like a ghost. And the damages were so much worse than everyone could ever imagine or account. Um, this frost is actually compared to the worst frost we had in 1975. So both of them consider very severe. And the, the um, result uh, of how much it was damaged is still being accounted because it really depends how deep the, the the tree got, got burned. Mm -hmm. And now uh, a current and a future concern is the drought, which is being a serious issue. Today, I talked to, this morning, I talked to producer Mariana Veloso from Cerrado, and uh, she did say, well, yeah, there's a forecast of a little rain, but you know, don't be glad because they're talking about 10 milli milli millimeters of rain, when to go back on in track, they need at least 30 millimeters every day for a few, for many days in a row to recoup and to get the, the plants back to the, the healthy um, stage. So, and uh, she also informed me, which is quite sad, it's um, there's many burnings of, of plantations and she inclusively had one herself. She just gave me this news. It was not a coffee plantation that burned because of the drought and the extremely high temperatures in Cerrado. It was part of the local visit vegetation um, but it's it's a it's a crazy sad scenario, and uh, the hopes for rain is very little. And now it's we have to observe day by day and see and pray. And um, yes, uh, they, this time it's really fortunate for those that have irrigation. Uh, thankfully, Mariana has. In Cerrado, these days is impossible to do uh, without the irrigation system. In south of Minas is a little bit more doable. So yeah, let's keep an eye on this drought. As you saw in this first scene here, the water is a pretty low tide. So huge concern. The aftermath, oh my God, I think this is the slide I have the hardest time to speak about because we don't have the numbers yet. It is very hard to account with everything that's happening, uh, how much we have. We are still harvesting, we're at the very end of the harvest. I would say maybe 90, 95 already harvested, but uh, we don't have these numbers yet. Procafe is accounting the damages and uh, will probably release in one and two weeks the, their numbers. Uh, from what I've been speaking to producers, they're in the average of uh, 56 million bags total production for Crop 21 for 2021. Yet, I have friends from uh, the Agronomic Institute, Sergio Pereira, which said, which said he's very, um, he's not, he's an agronomist, so he's not a, a producer, a very neutral opinion. He said he thinks it will be less, but these are opinions. In the end, we do have to wait a little bit longer, finish the harvest, check the, the damages with um, the frost. And uh, yeah. And then have for a certain number. Uh, I'd like to quickly mention, I know my time is it's done here, the nurseries. A lot of nurseries were also affected. So these are numbers that in two, three years we would have. And now we do not have these coffees planted and, and coming in production in the next two to three years. And quickly mention the, also the certification. If you like certified coffees, I will tell you, and you haven't bought it yet, I would um, tell you to, or advise you to go ahead and make your call because as, as UT and RFA unite, uh, we will have a uh, lower quantity uh, than 
than actually people think. Because a lot of producers that have both certification, let's say 100 bags of oats, which are the same 100 bags of RFA, now that they, they unite, people were at home. Overall, they were accounting 200 bags, which in the reality is only 100. So there's a true fear from myself that we will have a bigger demand than uh, certif uh, certified coffees available. Uh, where do we go? So yeah, all these factors account into higher prices for everyone. Not only the sea market is going up, here you can see the peak when, when the frost hit. Uh, I've never seen anything as such. It was day after day of increase in the market. Now it's stabling a little bit, still much higher than uh, before the frost. But yeah, in the end, everyone is suffering with higher prices, with higher costs in the production side, logistic, sea market, roasters, and final consumer, I think will eventually be um, there as well. So yeah, last but not least, I leave you with a video with more of uh, this harvest trip and some of my farms. I really want to thank all my partner farms, um, Veloso in Cerrado, Fazendas Dutra and Plan My Organics in Mata Juminas, SH Coffee, Hold Strong, my friend. He got 200 hectares of his plantation burn out of uh, 1,100. So very, very tough. A lot of investments in um, and technology, and now they'll have to invest back in the, the plantation themselves. I really want to thank my friend Henata Eller from Eller's Coffee. She is my partner in Site and Origin. When I'm not able to be there, we're talking daily, and she's sending me data and um, on ground work. She, uh, she travel with me this harvest season as well, and she's a great partner with, yeah. All this information I'm, I'm sparing a lot comes from her, Walters and Associates, of course. And I put a little Mulege there, or big Mulege, but uh, I haven't really talked about there. They're my Ethiopian partners. I also work with Ethiopia, Colombia, and Hawaii. So thank you, um, everyone, for the support. And yeah, I, I would like to leave you with the question of what's outside your box. So please think consciously when you're deciding to, to purchase coffee and think about the whole chain and uh yeah think sustainable let's keep the, the market going coffee makes the world go round and uh in the end it's the prices we pay that that gives us the future so thank you very much and i am gonna stop sharing this thing. Thank you, Annika. Yes, it um, it was really great to get some video. I think that that really sort of puts into perspective what we're talking about when we talk about mm -hmm. frost in, um, in Brazil. What does that look like? Um, uh, and it's great to sort of start this event, have the first presentation be about something that's so timely, um, because I know that we would have ended up getting questions about it no matter what we talked about first thing, just because it's so much on everyone's um, on everyone's mind. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions that I would love to ask before getting questions from the audience. We have a few of those also already, but um, one of the things that um, I think is interesting about your perspective and position is that you do sort of occupy this dual role and can see both sides of this dynamic. Um, so I'd love to, you know, ask you at different times to speak from the perspectives of, you know, a producer a representative and importer. Um, and in the first one, you know, going back to where you started with this logistics um, logjam and the supply chain disruptions we're seeing here, I wonder, you know, do you see anyone coming out of this unscathed, whether producers or buyers or is everyone going to be in pain in coffee and specialty coffee for the foreseeable future? Yes, because as I mentioned, this is snowball and it's a worldwide logistics problem. You know, it's not Brazil that's creating, it's not Colombia that's creating, it's a combination worldwide. And these containers are just, instead of going, you know, one stop or two to the destination, they're stopping everywhere. So uh, um, from my perspective, everyone is suffering, including the, 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 the big ones as well. With cost, yeah. with time, and uh, because it became a problem as well, uh, the time to get yeah. the booking, and once the coffee actually loads and, and, and leaves, the time to arrive is triple as much. Yeah. So yeah, I think everyone everyone is, is getting hurt. Yeah. 
Um, most of the questions that have come in from the audience and uh, and the other ones that I have relate to the um, the frost kind of angle or the frost piece of your presentation. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I wondered, you know, Red Container was founded in 2018. So you know, you all don't maybe as a company have experience with the last frost, but um, your family's companies surely would have been. And I wonder how long it takes to rebuild after an event like this and whether you anticipate a significant number of producers exiting the market after an event like this. Yeah, so yeah, the frost about, I, I wasn't present in the 75, but um, I hear about it, but yes, no, but a frost takes about three years to recoup. And the plants will never produce the same. Uh, that's a fact. So it will be a lower yield, uh, lower quality. It, it's it's just never back to to the the, the um, higher health state of the of the, of the, the plants itself. And, and do you anticipate people getting out of coffee production as a result? Oh yes, there yeah, it's happening already, and it is a great fear. Because again, it takes three years. Smaller producers, some of them lost 100%. My producer lost 200, 200 hectares of 1,000, um, 1,100. So we're talking about 20%. And, uh, but still he has some coffee to, to deal and to get over this hard year. But what about smaller producers that actually lost everything? They got that whole, because the, what happened to this frost, it was really strange. If you see the scenes from above, airplanes and, and pictures, it was like a God's knees and, and it's just everywhere. And it even got Cerrado, which is the first time. Uh, when I woke up, I was calling all my South of Minas contacts, you know, my, my, my um, Matas de Minas, high altitude. The last person I called was Cerrado because I didn't even think it got hit there. When I call Mariana, it also got hit there. So um, I think I lost myself a little bit on the question. <laughs> no, it's okay. The but, question was, I mean, what the, the sort of experiences you're reflecting are those that would suggest that some people are not going to um, oh, want yeah, to but, reinvest and, uh, and risk this yes. kind of loss again. Yes, I mean, would you? Uh, you know, you have a little piece of land. You can choose between a crop that you pro that will produce every year, like soy, or a crop they'll take three years and God knows if there's gonna be another frost. I mean, it's extremely important Brazil comes with money to help these producers. The coffee industry in Brazil is even talking about uniting itself with maybe a, you know, a donation per back to a coffee fund because Brazil, I think they came with a 1.3 billion uh, reais, and, which is not enough to help everyone and uh, if, if it is to continue for these smaller producers that got hit with 100%, if it is for them to continue in the coffee industry, they'll have to have help. So I'm not sure if I would, to be honest. So it is a, a true threat that many of these producers that got hit, they will, they will change to a different commodity for sure. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to ask one that came in from Loic in the audience. Um, he asks, are only full sun farms have a, were only full sun farms heavily impacted by drought and frost or shaded plantations too? Well, as I said, it was a big splash everywhere. Most of it was south of Minas and uh, lower lands closer to water, which, you know, usually you have a farm close to water, great, you, you have your natural irrigation there, but in a situation of frost, it's actually, it, it provokes uh, it stronger. Uh, so uh, mostly it, it, it got a little bit of everyone. Cerrado, Matas de Minas, no. But Mojana, Cerrado, and South of Minas splashes everywhere. Yeah. Mostly lower lands and closer to water. I'm going to sneak one more in from Lindsay um, because it's a good segue or a good uh, uh, build on the last question. Um, Lindsay asks, is there anything being done in automated frost mitigation systems in the area? I don't know anything about those. Do you know I'm what that sure person is referring to? That. No, I'm not. So if anything is done in, can you ask In again, terms please? of automated uh, frost oh. mitigation systems. No, I'm, I'm not aware, but I don't believe so. Um, haven't heard about it. 
Uh, what is being done now, to be honest, we're still in the stage where they're accounting. So, and, and decisions, of course, of what type, how they'll treat each individual case. But uh, yeah, that's that's all I can say about it for now. Sorry. Yeah. No, this has been great. Thank you so much for um for everything that you've shared here. It's a really great snapshot of this moment in history that we're all living through. Um, Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you for the invite. It's an honor to participate in a CA event. So 